Hi, in this video I want to help you to find the right camera for every budget. It is December of 2022 right now and there have been some surprising camera releases during this year, what actually puts every camera manufacturer in a really good position. So I think that the information from this video should be valid for at least a year, maybe even longer. Of course, I will also mention a few other cameras in this video that already came out before 2022, but they are still relevant. So you got a good overview of the best cameras that you can buy right now. I will go through four categories in this video. At first the low budget category below $1000, then between $1000 and $2000, the mid-range category, then semi-professional between $2000 and $3000, and everything above $3000 professional. Of course the prices can vary a little bit depending on the country and the taxes that you're in. And you will find links to all cameras that I mentioned in this video in the description below, which is great to support this channel if you find this video was helpful, because there I get a 5% commission but you don't pay anything extra. They are all Amazon links so it's also convenient to order for you. And if I don't mention a camera that you're looking for it's most likely because there are better cameras available in this price range. So in that case only look at the cameras that I mentioned here and you will be happy with your purchase. Let's get started. Okay, our first camera in the low budget category is the Sony ZV-10. That's a camera that I think is most interesting to most people. And it comes at $698 or $798 with a kit lens, what I can actually recommend. I will come to in a second why. And the advantages of the ZV-10 is clearly the Sony autofocus. It's really good. It never really loses your face. So it's great for vlogging, especially in general content creation. And it is a 4K camera. You can shoot 4K up to 30 frames per second. And if you want to shoot slow motion, you can do that in 1080p at up to 120 frames per second, what gives you up to five times slow motion. It also comes with a mic input and it has electronic image stabilization, what is important if you want to shoot smooth B-roll. Good about the system is also that you can already use all the full frame or more expensive APS-C lenses with the ZV-E10. So if you want to upgrade your camera body later, you already have the lenses available then. The big problem with this camera though is the bad rolling shutter performance. Rolling shutter means that that if you move the camera around, especially to the sides, that you oftentimes see bending lines there. That looks pretty ugly. This is actually why I personally only used the ZV-10 for three weeks. I just didn't like the video that I got out of this camera, mainly because of the rolling shutter performance. And the other issue is that it has a really big crop if you want to stabilize the video and that can be problematic for vlogging. So if you want to vlog with this camera, it's way too close to your face. And that is also the reason why I recommend getting this camera together with the kit lens, because the kit lens has optical image stabilization included so you don't necessarily have to use the electronic image stabilization in the camera what gives you a wider field of view. And the next camera worth mentioning here is the Nikon Z30. I didn't use it by myself but it looks really promising from what I've seen and it is also in the same price range at $657 body only, $797 for the body and the kit lens 16 to 50 and specs wise it's overall very similar to the ZV-E10 it is also a 4K camera, 4K 30 frames per second, also 1080 up to 120 frames per second for a slow motion. But it has a few advantages and that's at first that the rolling shutter performance looks a lot better on the Z30, at least from what I could see in all those reviews. So I would prefer this camera over the ZV-E10. And it also doesn't have a crop with its electronic image stabilization. I don't understand how they do it, if they use a slightly bigger sensor or something, some sort of magic there, but it doesn't have a crop and that is a hell of a difference because you can actually use your 16 millimeter lens at 16 millimeter without being too close, what makes this camera a bit better for vlogging. Now, when it comes to autofocusing, Nikon generally has a little bit weaker autofocus as Sony, but from what I've seen on this camera, it is also spot on. I never saw any review where the focus was hunting or where everyone complained about the autofocus and from the performance of Nikon cameras that I've seen on other people in reality and what other people told me they are generally good cameras so I assume that these reviews are right there and that you don't have to worry about the autofocus but if you want to be 100% safe that your autofocus is good you would rather go for the Sony however I generally think that the Nikon is a little bit better. Also worth mentioning for the Nikon is that you can also use Nikon full frame and APS-C lenses on this camera so 
so you can do the same with Sony already buying better lenses before buying a better body but you generally have less lens options with Nikon as with Sony so also look into the lenses that you want to buy in the future before investing in any of those systems. And our next camera is slightly more expensive that's the Canon R10 which starts at $879 for the body only then $999 for the kit with the 18 to 45 millimeter lens and $1,279 for the 18 to 150 millimeter kit lens. Now this camera is a little bit more expensive but it also comes with better features. At first you cannot only shoot 4K and up to 30 frames per second, you can also shoot 4K and 60 frames per second. Comes with a crop though but it's not a big issue to be honest especially considering the price and if you want to you can set this camera to HDR PQ which gives you more dynamic range and important here is that it records in 10 bit then and 10 bit gives you more options in color grading. So if you want to advance your color grading a little bit already while while you're still learning everything. That's a great camera to get. However, color grading HDR PQ footage is a bit more difficult. You definitely want to watch some tutorials before you do that. And when it comes to autofocus performance, my personal experience is that Sony is generally the best right now when it comes to autofocus, but Canon is only really slightly behind, which is mostly because the touch tracking on Canon cameras is not as sticky as it is on Sony. But for example, if you want to track your face, that works flawlessly on Canon. I'm sure Shooting on a Canon here right now, the R6 Mark II, and I don't expect that you will see any hunting during this video because it generally performs great, and I expect the same from the R10 because it's overall the up-to-date autofocusing system, so it's also great for content creators that have to film themselves a lot. What I also like about the Canon R10 is that it has a viewfinder, so the body design is generally more hybrid oriented. It's great for photography and videography. Both the Nikon and the Sony ZV-10 that I mentioned before for our cameras that don't have a viewfinder so they are generally more video oriented. You can also shoot photos with those cameras, it's just not as much fun as with the Canon R10. And when it comes to downsides, the only one that I can really see on the Canon R10 here is that the lens options are quite limited right now. If you want to use certain lenses, especially wider angle lenses for vlogging, then you would have to buy an EF to RF adapter and use all the Canon EF lenses on the R10, which generally works good, even the autofocusing etc doesn't have any issues there but depending on the lens it can make your overall setup a little bit front heavy and a little bit longer this is why I generally don't prefer using adapters but on the other hand there are great lenses available from Canon EF if you want to vlog for example the 10 to 18 millimeter EFS lens from Canon is great adapted to this camera is a really nice and lightweight setup it's sharp it's cheap and you can perfectly vlog so this is a setup that I could recommend in that case and this year I would actually mention four cameras in this category because it's really difficult otherwise. So the first one here is the Fujifilm X-S10 which comes at $999, a little bit more expensive but the Fujifilm X-S10 also has pretty big advantages and the biggest is that it is the only camera in that price range that features an IBIS. This is sensor stabilization so the sensor moves around and compensates for your shake and that can actually be really helpful especially if you want to vlog and aside from that it is also a 4k 30 frames per second camera but you can also shoot in full HD of up to 240 frames per second so even more slow motion than the other cameras and what I think many people will like about this camera is that the XS10 comes with Fujifilm film simulations these are essentially color profiles but they make your footage look really film like straight out of camera so you don't really have to color grade that much anymore and it already looks really good and that makes this camera actually quite special. If you want to vlog a lot, then this IBIS definitely helps. You get great colors there. And if you want to, you can also buy it together with a kit lens, the, 40, uh, the 15 to 45 millimeter, which is a little bit wider already and even better for vlogging. And the kit lens also has optical image stabilization, what works together with the sensor stabilization. So it's even more stable straight out of camera. The big disadvantage of this camera though is that the autofocus is definitely 
weaker than all the other cameras here that I've mentioned. It's not a big issue though. You can change the autofocusing settings to the slowest and simply keep the focus point on your face all the time. And then it will also not hunt or anything, then it's reliable. But if you wanna use face tracking, for example, if you wanna move throughout the frame, then you will get issues with this camera. Now, there are a few other cameras that I want to mention here, but that I would not necessarily recommend. And that is at first, if you're really on a really low budget, the Canon M50, it comes, I think at $500 or $600, something like that. And this camera features decent video overall, if you really wanna get started and you're on a budget, but it's, it's not great. Like it has a huge 4K crop, so it's more like a 1080p camera. You can't really shoot 4K with it. And to be honest, I think now in 2022 or 2023, we are already over 1080p. I think a camera should have 4K then. But yeah, if you're really on a budget and you don't even have a good phone that shoots decent video, then that might be an option. Aside from that, if autofocusing is also not really an issue for you, if you're mostly behind the camera and you use manual focus or you just lock the focus somewhere and leave it wherever it is, then you might also look into Panasonic cameras, especially the G85, G95, and G9 because all of those cameras have really good looking video straight out of camera and they have the best sensor stabilization in the business. So if you wanna get stable shots straight out of your hand, this is the way to go. And while the G85 and 95 are only 4K up to 30 frames per second cameras, the G9 can also shoot 4K 60 frames per second and also 10 bit if you want to color grade more. So these cameras are already a bit more on the professional side, but as mentioned before, if autofocusing is an issue, then don't that get these cameras. Panasonic is bad in that regards. Let's come to the mid-range market, thousand to two thousand dollars body only. I must say there we have seen huge changes in 2022. I did not expect that. First camera that I wanna talk about here is the Canon R7, which is an APS-C camera, which looks really capable to be honest. It comes at $1,499. And I would say the most standout features of this camera of this camera are that at first it has inbuilt sensor stabilization. And the one from Canon is actually quite good, except for if you wanna shoot at ultra wide angle lenses then you get a bit wobble in the corner generally, but in normal focal ranges that you usually shoot in, it's actually really, really good and close to Panasonic. And what makes this camera quite special is that you can record in 4K up to 60 frames per second full width, and you also have 10 bit in C-Log3 available in 4K 30 and 60 frames per second on this camera. And that is huge because that gives you around 12 stops of dynamic range. And that means that your footage already looks a lot more professional as on all the low budget cameras. Of course, the R7 also has a few downsides, but they're actually quite minor. At first, it only has a micro HDMI port. It's probably not a big issue for most people buying this camera because you probably won't use HDMI anyway. And the lens app options as of right now, at least the native RF lens options for Canon APS-C are also really limited. There are, I think, only two lenses or so. Plus you can use a full frame lenses, but they are quite expensive or the cheaper ones are a bit slower. So these are not the best lens options that you have there. If you get the R7, you definitely want to get an EF to RF converter or adapter and use their older EF lenses on this camera. I mentioned that already before in the low budget section when I talked about the Canon R10. It's the same here, it's the same mount, so same issue. But when we're only talking about the camera body, it definitely seems like a really good one. But there is also Sony with the FX30, and when we're only talking about video shooting, that seems to be an insane value camera. The FX30 is slightly more expensive at $1,798, but this, there's a good reason for it, because that is already a camera that belongs to Sony's cinema line, and that makes it super capable. This camera has 4K up to 120 frames per second. Now, in 4K 120, it has a crop of 1.6X, and this is a small downside, but not a big one, to be honest, because you can also shoot 4K 60 frames per second without a crop. 
and all of that is possible in 10 bit 42 shooting in s log 3 what gives you even more dynamic range as on the canon r7 i think it should be somewhat in the 13 stops range maybe a little bit less but somewhat in that range at least and aside from that it has other really professional videography options for example you can import LUTs in this camera which you can either use to only display on the screen while it records in S-Log3, so you see a color graded image on the screen, but the footage that you get is actually log footage, so you have the full flexibility in post. But what it can also do is to bake the LUTs directly in, so you can create your own look on the computer, save it as a LUT file, load it into the camera, and you already get this look straight out of camera without having to do any color grading. Aside from that, there are also a few other more cinema-oriented features, which is especially time code so you can sync it easily with other cameras if you have a multicam shoot and you can also output the video to an external recorder in 16-bit raw so you can record raw video with this camera that is also important for professional workflows and I think it even has breathing compensation so if you have a lens that zooms slightly in and out while focusing that's compensated for digitally and that looks a lot better when shooting video so overall the FX30 seems to be the most capable video camera overall in that price range but there's also Panasonic with the S5 and the Panasonic S5 comes at only $1,497 it's actually really cheap for a full frame camera that powerful and this camera also features 4k 60 frames per second not 4k 120 though and the 4k 60 has a crop which is to be expected because it's a full frame camera in that price range but it also shoots 10 bit 42 you can record in vlog what also gives you a lot of dynamic range and because it's a full frame camera it is also really good for low light and overall the image quality that you get of Panasonic cameras is stunning. You can also export raw video 5.9k from this camera to an external recorder if you want to what also makes this camera really capable for professional workflows and to be honest if you look at the price, $1,500, this is actually really good for what you get there. Now, there is one downside that comes with Panasonic and that's again the autofocus. Even on the full frame cameras, the autofocus sucks, which is why I think that most people would rather go for the Sony FX30 or the Canon R7. But yeah, overall, if autofocusing is not an issue for you, then the Panasonic S5 for that price is probably the best deal that you can get there. Of course, there are also a few other cameras in this price range that are worth mentioning, mainly the, the Fujifilm X-T4, which is a great camera overall, 10-bit 4-2-0, also 4K60 recording, nice Fuji colors, etc. But the autofocus lags a little bit behind, which is why I think for video, most people will rather go for the FX30. Then there's also the Sony Os A7C, which is a full-frame camera as well. But again, I think the video quality that you get from it overall is quite similar to what you get from the FX30, so I would rather go for that. But there is one more interesting camera, which is the Fujifilm X-H2. Super powerful, you can record ProRes, it can record 8K, it has a 40 megapixel sensor, so really good if you want to shoot print photos as well. Fujifilm colors, so overall a great camera, but it costs around $2,000 and I think most people that mainly shoot video would rather go for the FX30 again because you also have 4K 120 frames per second available there. It's overall a better video camera. And let's come to the semi-professional market, $2,000 to $3,000, but actually all three bodies that I recommend in this price range come at exactly the same price, around $2,000. $500. These are the Sony a7 IV, the Canon R6 Mark II and the Fujifilm X-H2S. And I actually did a quite in-depth comparison about all three cameras last week. I will leave, leave that video here. It is 40 minutes long to be honest, so if you really want to watch it, it takes a lot of time. But I want to give you a quick conclusion here from this review so that you know which camera might be for you. But at first I want to say that all of these different 
differences between those bodies are so minor that you can literally just go into a shop, put them all three on the table, put your fingers on them and see how they feel like and just choose the cameras that feels best for you. So I would say let's start with the features of this body that are all the same and that is that all of those bodies record 4K up to 60 frames per second. They all have 10 bit 4 to 2 internally available. They all can shoot in good lock profiles. They all have a stabilized sensor. They all have a mic jack. So everything that you really need from a video camera. So let's talk about the differences. And I would say let's start with the Canon R6 Mark II that I'm shooting on right now. I would say the biggest downside of this camera compared to the others is that it only has about 12 stops of dynamic range, while the others are more in the 13 and a half to 14 and a half stops already. So it's quite a difference, but nothing that actually made a practical difference for me in most shooting situations so I don't really care about that. But where the R6 Mark II is really strong is that you can shoot 4K 60 frames per second oversampled on this camera. This is the thing on the Sony a7 IV where the 4K 60 frames per second comes with a crop. You don't have that on the Canon M6 Mark II. And the R6 Mark II can also shoot in full HD up to 180 frames per second if you want super slow motion. But even more important is that it features false color what makes exposing your shots a lot easier easier and it also features breathing compensation so if you have a lens that breathes a lot that zooms slightly in and out while focusing then it's compensated for what looks a lot better in video. However there's one more disadvantage to the Canon R6 Mark II which is that the lens choices are quite limited. You can't buy any third-party lenses right now for Canon RF and that is actually the reason why I think that most people would rather go for Sony right now because obviously you want to have a bit cheaper lenses that are still good and on Canon you end up paying a bit more or having lenses that have uh, higher apertures or so. So that's definitely a downside to consider. But let's also talk about the Sony a7 IV and the main differences from the a7 IV compared to the other bodies is that it crops in 4K 60 frames per second. It's not actually a big issue to be honest. I used the a7 IV for over half a year and I never found that to be an issue. But of course if you can choose between having a crop in 4K 60 or not then it's better not to have one so you get the exact same framing as in 4K up to 30 frames per second. Aside from that it features a 33 megapixel sensor which is actually quite nice if you also want to do photography and maybe smaller prints already or if you shoot time lapses and you want to crop a lot. But that 33 megapixel sensor also comes with the disadvantage that the rolling shutter of this camera in video is pretty bad so if you move the camera a bit around you get a distorted image and that is definitely worse compared to the R6 Mark II and the Fujifilm X-H2S. The a 7 IV also has really good dynamic range. You can get around 14 stops out of this camera, which is already really good. Um, but when we compare it to the Fujifilm X-H2S, you see that there is a bit more noise reduction going on in the shadows of the Sony, which gives you a little bit less shadow detail. In certain situations, it can actually make your shadows look a bit mushy. While this is actually something where the Fujifilm is better, you get a bit more noise in the Fujifilm film on in the shadows but therefore there's also more detail and in that case I would actually prefer having a bit more noise then. So I would say let's also talk a bit more about the Fujifilm X-H2S. At first what you probably notice is that it has an APS-C sensor not a full frame sensor which is actually not a big issue because it is a stacked BSI sensor which makes the sensor reading super fast and that is important for videography because that lets Fujifilm read more data in a smaller amount of time so you send get more dynamic range. That's why the dynamic range of the Fujifilm is on the same if not even a slightly better level as it is on the a7 IV. Plus you don't have this strong noise reduction going on in the shadows again so the shadows look a bit better in my opinion. And it also means that you have really good rolling shutter performance on the Fujifilm X-H2S. I would actually go as far as saying that if you record in F-Log1 on this camera, this is where you get the best rolling shutter performance or you record in F-Log2 with 4K 60 or 4K 120 frames per second, then the rolling shutter from what I could see is pretty much unnoticeable. So it comes close to having a global shutter on this camera. So rolling shutter performance is definitely something where the X-H2S shines over the other cameras and even lots of more expensive cameras than them. It is actually even slightly better as the Sony a7S 3 
and that means something. But that's not all when it comes to the Fujifilm X-H2S. There are even more insane specs. It can also shoot in 4K 120 frames per second with a slight crop. I think it was 1.39 or so. So not an issue at all. Aside from that, you can also shoot in 6.2K open gate. Open gate means that it actually records the full sensor and not only the 16 by nine or 17 by nine middle part. And talking about 17 by nine, it can also record in 4K DCI. What I really love is Sony and the Canon don't do that. Would be a nice feature to add for Sony and Canon there. And it also comes with internal ProRes recording. And of course, it's a Fujifilm camera, so it also comes with Fujifilm film simulations. And I really love them. It makes your footage look already really good straight out of camera. Of course, it's not the same as shooting an F-Log2, F-Log1. You get less dynamic range in film simulations. But if you want to have a nice look straight out of camera, then especially Eterna or Classic Chrome are great, great picture profiles or film simulations that you have available there. But it also comes with a few major downsides and that's at first that the autofocus is definitely a bit weaker as it is on Sony and Canon. Now, don't get me wrong here, the autofocus is not bad on this camera. In most situations, it will perform perfectly fine. But for example, in a few situations, such as my studio here with the great walls, there I get a lot of hunting. And it's also that you don't have features such as touch tracking available on the autofocusing system on Fujifilm. But therefore, from my experience, when you shoot outside, especially the object tracking of the XH2S works really, really good. And if you encounter certain situations where the autofocusing doesn't do what you want, you can always put it to zone or single autofocus and just leave the autofocus point on your subject. And it then also focuses perfectly fine, no hunting or anything. So overall, the autofocusing system from the XH2S is not as good as Sony and Canon, but you can make it work for pretty much every situation so for most people I think it's not really an issue so again in this price range I can only say that it doesn't really matter what camera you get you will be happy with any of those I personally went for the R6 Mark II now which is mainly because I really love the RFL lenses especially the 15 to 35 millimeter lens what I'm shooting on right now and I also really enjoy the Canon bodies that's my choice but again I think that most people will be most happy with the Sony a7 IV mainly because of the better lens choices So let's come to the professional category, everything above $3,000. I have the R5 here, but this is actually not my most recommended camera. My most recommended camera in this price range hasn't changed from last year, and that is the a7S III or FX3, simply because these are the cameras that have the least amount of compromises when it comes to video shooting, or I would actually say there are no compromises because for video, 12 megapixels are totally fine, and the 12 megapixels pixels is the only compromise that you find on this cameras and the reason is pretty clear I mean the rolling shutter performance is great you have 4k up to 120 frames per second full frame readout or I think 10% crop doesn't really matter you don't see that anyway you can record externally in ProRes RAW you have a full-size HDMI to do so so overall I think that the a7s3 and fx3 are the cameras that most people should go for in this price range however there's also the r5 which is only slightly more more expensive and last year I did not really recommend the R5 because of the overheating issues but it looks like the overheating issues got solved at least from what I could see right now while I was shooting with the R5 I never got any overheating issues not even a warning and from what I see from reviews people record in room temperatures for up to two hours in 8k so it seems like this is now finally a viable video camera and I think that you might want to go for the Canon R5 over the a7s3 mainly if you need more megapixels because that's really the only advantage you can shoot 8k with more megapixels it's better for photography it's better for time lapses but it also comes with the disadvantage of having less dynamic range than the sony a7s3 and it's also not as good in low light as the a7s3 it's not a big difference though because if you shoot in 4k in low light it oversamples from 8k which also reduces the noise so it's certainly not bad in low light conditions but the a7s3 is just a little bit better Aside from that, in that price range, you will also find, of course, more expensive cameras that are more in the five to six thousand dollar range. That is the Sony A1, that is the Canon R3, and the Nikon Z9. 
And these cameras are also all quite similar actually because they all work with stacked sensors. And again, stacked sensors allow much faster reading of the sensor. So you get better rolling shutter performance. They can oversample from 14 or 16 bit, what essentially means that you get more dynamic range. And of course it also makes things like 4K 120, etc., easy. So this is what all these cameras give you. And I think deciding between those cameras at first is between the bodies. The Air 1 is still a small body mirrorless size while the R3 and Z9 are quite big so that is definitely something to consider but aside from that when we are deciding then between the R3 and the Z9 it really just comes down to again megapixels do you need this I think 45 megapixels from the Z9 and 8k recording or are the 24 megapixels from the R3 enough and you would rather go for the Canon system so that's really what it comes down to and I think in that price range you also already know what you want so that make should make the decision really easy for you so i would say let's wrap this video up here by quickly going through the categories again if i would choose a camera in the low budget category that would be the r10 for me simply because it does everything pretty good in that category at least then in the semi-professional market i would go for the fx30 i would actually say that the fx30 is overall from all categories the winner here because the fx30 offers everything that you really need as a videographer 10 with 42 4k 120 frames per second there's not more to ask for and you pay less than thousand eight hundred dollars for it that's insane if you think about it and then in the professional market it's it's hard to say a clear winner for me they are all winners i went for the r6 mark ii as mentioned and a7s3 or fx3 in the professional market. So I really hope this video was helpful to make a decision what camera you should buy. And again, I made a comparison between the R6 Mark II, A7 IV and X-H2S recently. You will find that video here in the corner. And also, if you missed that in the beginning, there are links to all of those cameras in the description below. So if you found this video helpful, please use these links in the description below, then I get a small commission. You don't pay anything extra. And if not, then at least please leave me a thumbs up and consider subscribing for upcoming videos. I see you there.